Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Norm Rasmussen, Director of Precious Testimonies. In the Old Testament book of Psalms, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies is a non-denominational outreach, giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what He has done in their lives. A secondary purpose of this outreach is to be used of the Holy Spirit to bring forth insight to those who are seeking some answers about God and to minister to those who are hurting and those who are in hopeless situations. We have a couple by the name of Dick and Judy Peel, and they're going to be ministering from their hearts. And I would encourage you to be expecting God to minister something special just for you. As you've heard it, I was uh, saved as a little boy. And I'd just like to read something that uh, the Lord has laid in my heart. It said, Lord, remember thy handmaiden, and give unto her a male child, and I will give him unto the Lord. This was prayed by my mother sometime before 1943, uh, the year I was born. And she asked the Lord for a godly man, and that was Hannah's prayer. And God showed me this <clears throat> a couple years ago. She, she died six years ago, so I can't talk to her about this, but the Spirit showed me this, that she prayed that prayer for me. Uh, and she, before she died though, she did see or know that she had a godly man. And uh, so I'll share my testimony. Uh, part of what we don't realize when other people commit for us on our behalf. We have mothers and grandmothers and fathers and grandfathers who have committed us to the Lord. And that's what my mother it did for me that she uh, committed to the Lord to be a godly man. And my testimony is not dramatic as far as my conversion because I was saved as a little boy. As far as I can remember back, I've always been saved. But I also know that I had a very deep uh, awareness of pleasing God just when I was little. And uh, my mother taught me, she spent time with me, of course, in training me. And uh, so I'm sure a lot of that, was, that came from her. Uh, my father was not saved, and uh, I didn't realize this till later on. Cause my mother didn't share a lot of things personally, but uh, my dad didn't make it easy for her. And uh, he was during the early part of their marriage. And I was about nine years old when my dad was, was saved or born again. And I remember my mother and I saying prayers at night, praying for my dad's salvation. And I saw him saved, and our home changed for the good. We had a lot of things. Uh, he got involved in church. He was the uh, Sunday school superintendent of our small church. And I was raised in a little country church of about 30 people. And that was a home. It was a Baptist church. And we were faithful. And my mother was very instrumental in, in starting the church back up and, and ministering. And that's why she was saying, where are the gods of men? She was looking for men to rise up. And this was back in the 40s and 50s. A lot of men were not the leaders, the spiritual leaders. They, you know, they hadn't been taught. Uh, they may have been Christians, but sometimes they were silent Christians. And the, the woman led out. And my mother was very concerned about this. She taught me biblically from a little boy up all my life until you know I moved out of the home. She said this about me. She said, "You, you'll either be a preacher or an auctioneer because your mouth is never still. It was always going." <laughs> She also said that she never worried about where I was as long as she could hear me. Because she knew, you know, because I always made noise. And uh, I have two older sisters. I'm like 10 years behind, so I was kind of a tag. So they were, one sister is 13 or 14 years older than I am. And I don't even remember her being home. And she was like married and gone when I was growing up. But my other sister was kind of like my mother. She had to take care of me. And uh, she said that, she used to she tell the story that when I was little, I had a, a cardboard box every day that I used to use as a pulpit. And I had my little testament, and I'd stand behind that, and I'd preach. And so I was either preaching or auctioneering something. And so she, she still tells that story. She said one of her favorite times was when I was about three years old. 
I had this little brown teddy bear, as most little boys do, and he was my favorite, of course, the one I took to bed with me and everything. And I do not know why, what possessed me, but one day I decided that he needed a funeral. <laughs> and so I laid him out in my little red wagon, I pulled him up, I got behind my box, I got my New Testament, and I preached his funeral. <laughs> and then I had a procession, and I took him out and buried him. But I didn't remember where I buried him. And so that night, when it was time to go to bed, I was crying my eyes out, and my mother sent my sister, made her go outside and try to find my teddy bear. And she searched and searched, and she couldn't find him. And we never did find that teddy bear, and I don't know where it went. But I know I give him a proper funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and my, you know, when I was 11 years old in 1955, uh, my dad died. And he'd been, only been a saved a couple of years, and that was a change in my life. We were farmers. And uh, I had spent a lot of time with my dad. Of course, him being employed at home, I was right behind him, his footsteps, wherever we went, that's where I was. And uh, as far as I knew, I was going to be a farmer because I was doing what he did. And when I was nine years old, my dad it was in the winter time. We had a big snowstorm. And my dad, we had a baby calf, and it was a pure white calf. And we called it a snowball. And my dad gave me that calf. And I was like nine years old. And I raised that calf, and it was, so I started when I was nine years old. By the time I was 11, he died, I had, a, I had a cow, I had a heifer, and I had a bull calf already. So I'd already started my herd when I was 11 years old. And so when my father died, my mother sold our farm, and we moved to town. And she took the, the money from my animals that she'd sold, and she started a college fund for me. No one in my family had ever gone to college. My two sisters had graduated from high school, but both my parents only had eighth grade educations. And so I know it was desire of my mother that I have a college education. And uh, so we changed from being farmers into city dwellers, and uh, that was quite a, a step for me. But uh, you adjust when you're, when you're little or whatever, you know, in life, you just roll and go with it. And, uh, I was thinking about what my father, what happened to him, and how that changed my life. You know, it was through my, my restoration that happened in the last about eight, eight years that I really understood some of the things that, that happened to me when my father had died. When I was 11 years old and he passed away so suddenly with a heart attack, I had vowed this vow that I was going to be a success. And I don't know where this came from except the Lord did show me here uh, in the last couple of years. But I had vowed this vow that I would be a success at all costs. And that, that vow drove me all through my early life because I had to do what uh, knew I vowed to do. Later on, the Lord has showed me, or like I said, two years ago, He showed me that why I did that was it was a commitment to complete what my dad wasn't able to do. And we think about things that happen, we think back on them sometimes, that how tragedies or some things like this can affect us. I was so driven, and I don't know why this came in, but I just know that it was there. It was like nothing was going to deter me from accomplishing this. And what it did, it created a lot of problems for me in my lifetime because I was so driven to do that. I didn't, you know, nothing else mattered except doing what was what I said to do and that would be successful. When I was 18 years old, I was faced with a crossroads, as many of us are, and I had to make a choice. I'd been a, raised as a, as, from a child as a Christian. I served the Lord. I had a desire to, to do what God wanted me to. Uh, I was a pleaser, in other words. I did what was expected of me, and uh, I was a good. I mean, as far as I guess compared to what other kids have gotten into, I didn't get in trouble. But at 18, I had to make the choice whether for my life, whether I would serve God or I would go the world's way. And I was at a crossroad. And I had a wrestling match. Because, you know, the world was tugging me, but I knew what I'd been trained and what God wanted me to do. And so I, I wrestled the Lord. And my biggest fear was He's going to ask me to be a missionary. And I don't know why this is a problem for a lot of people, but they have a similar story. God's going to call me to some foreign field. And I, I really wrestled, and I wrestled one night all, long, all night long, and finally 
I got down on my knees and I said, I give up, God. You can have me. You can do with me what you want, and I'll go anywhere you want me to. And that was when I was 18, and uh, I made that commitment from that day, point, or that day to live uh, a daily walk with the Lord. And I am 54 years old, and I have to say that I walked that in all these years through the trials and testings, things. There's things I've been closer to the Lord than other times, but I've never departed from that. I've never turned uh, away from the Lord. Uh, when I couldn't understand anything, I just I still stood there and, and waited to find When I was 18, I chose life verses, Proverbs 3, 4, and 5, is trust in the Lord with all thine heart. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. God led me to a Christian college when, right then, and this was not in my original plans. And when I committed myself to the Lord at 18, boy, the next two months things changed completely in my life. I had planned to go to a secular school, and God just turned and opened the doors, and I went to a Christian college. I graduated with a degree in business, and I started my business career or life career. God was blessing me with good positions in the business world. And as I prospered and climbed the corporate ladder, and during this time my marriage was prospering, I had three wonderful children, I had lived a clean, godly, moral life, separate from the world, and I prayed about everything. I sought godly counsel. I asked God for wisdom and for life and life's problems and work. And I made myself available to serve in my church. And uh, since God had gifted me with a gift of administration, I gave it back to the guy, he used it. Uh, I served for many years as a leader, as a teacher, a deacon, or on a board member of the church. Thirteen years after I had got into my career, it was about 1980, I had a very successful, uh, I was approaching my, the, my goal, life goal of reaching the success, being successful in my eyes. and. Uh, I was approaching that goal where I wanted to own my own company and work for myself. At the time, I was a corporate executive, a member and a board member of a very successful company. I drove new cars, lived in a beautiful Crickside home, and I enjoyed a good Christian marriage. I was highly respected as a church leader and a picture of our success in the eyes of my, my Christian friends and my family. And I thank God for the fact that He had blessed me so prosperously because I had prospered. I, I was young when I moved into positions that were very high positions and, and a lot of responsibility. And with the work ethics that I had and for the, the drive to be successful and with God's directing me and, and blessing me, I w was successful. But I was not fulfilled. And I reached that point called like, well, I've reach this threshold, Lord, now, and if you've blessed me materially and position-wise, and now I want to enter into the next phase, or I want to go to the next step. And as I said, it was, I asked the Lord for two things. I said, I, God, I want a deeper walk with you, and I want an understanding of who you are, and I want to experience a deeper faith walk. In other words, I wanted to learn to exercise my faith. I had held good positions of salary, I had you know, I made good money and everything, and so I really wanted to experience the faith walk. And that was just the things I asked the Lord for. I was very proud of my accomplishments, knowing that I that was the only one in my family that had gone to college and had graduated and had climbed the corporate ladder. And my clean and life and uh, moral walk had given me much success in, in serving God without faltering. My desire for success and rising above the worldly standards, experiencing God's blessing on my life and blessing me as He had, uh, I opened the door for pride. Because I had walked as a little boy through the training. I did what I was asked. God had blessed me. And I had, I had gotten through the world system without being touched. And so I was proud of my accomplishments, and most of us should be. And other people were proud of me too. I know my mother was very proud of me because I would basically had, had reached a success. But because of my pride, it opened the door for pride, and I had a very prideful spirit. 
And I knew that inside of me that I had this, and, and, and I didn't show it to a lot of people, and a lot of people may have seen it because we don't always hide what we think we are. But inside of me, I was very proud because I knew I'd come from here and gone to here. And I knew it was with God's help, but I was blessed. And this was a, uh, because of this, I knew inside of me down deep, although I'd worked with people, I didn't have a compassion for them. And I didn't love them. And I knew that. And I had to say to God, I said, God, I know I don't feel right, but I should love this person. But I didn't. And, uh, and so that was the area that was affecting me. I was a perfectionist, and I tried to live up to God's standards, perfect standards. Didn't matter what I accomplished I, or anybody else, I believed it could be done better because we're dealing with God now. God's a perfect person, and we're trying to raise the standards. Consequently, I never fully appreciated who I was or who other people were. And this created alienation in my family between my wife, between my kids, because Dad always had this standard of perfection. And I, I didn't compare my kids, in other words, one or the other, but I look at them and I'd say, you're capable of doing this. And so I expect you to raise to that standard. And, and I couldn't say when they did something that was good, I could only see, well, yeah, but this part's not done. And that, you know, and many of you may have experienced that in your lives, but I also did. And that was creating a real problem. Because I was so driven by this drive to be successful and this whole force in my life, I was set up for a fall. You know, the, the word says, pride goes before a fall. And that's where I was. In 1981, I left the corporate position and purchased a small company, which was my life's goal. Uh, the next four years, I poured myself into it, trying to make the business a success. If you recall back then, it was in the early 80s, we are in recession. Uh, interest rates were high. I borrowed money at 22.5% to buy a business, and I look back now on that and I said I must have been insane, because 22.5% was, I mean, you got to make a good money to be able to pay for that. But it was the next step in accomplishing my life goal, it didn't matter. I mean, I prayed about it, I felt it was God's doing, and I did it. And, uh, but it didn't matter just how hard I worked how hard I prayed, or what I attempted to do, it didn't seem like the sales were enough. And the, but the business was faltering. And I was starting, I was being faced with a very, very difficult situation. And I was being faced with the fact that I might fail. And I had been set up and programmed to not fail, as many of us are, and especially in America. We only think we can succeed there's nothing beyond failure. It's like it's the end. And this was my life dream. And so this, when I would give up, this would be it, as far as the way I was programmed to think. And so I was really struggling with this. I mean, I spent many sleepless nights. And I can identify with anybody who can't sleep. I, I lived on the couch. And the only sleep I got a lot of nights was when I fell asleep reading my Bible. And I wouldn't even turn the light off because if it did, then I'd start thinking about things. And so I fell asleep, the Bible laying on my chest, the light on, and that's why it would be in the morning. And that's the only sleep I was getting. At the time, my middle daughter was 12 years old. And she, one day she observed that I was sleeping in bed now. And she came to me and she said, Dad, she said, is the business doing better? because you are sleeping. I said, why? She said, well, you're sleeping in bed now. And I said, okay, well, I didn't realize what I was doing. But you know, I got something to share. You know, this was my journey, and I never shared with my kids my emotions or what I was doing. And I, I just, it was a big mistake as I look back because they never knew their dad. They never, you see, I was a perfectionist. And if I would admit that I was struggling or having problems, then I wouldn't live up to that standard. 
And then my kids would see that I wasn't. And so this was a real problem. And I, I'm really sorry. I mean, their kids are grown, but they never knew their dad. And if you're going through problems and you're struggling with things, family problems or anything at home, I advise you, be real and share it with your kids. Bring them into your life. Let them see that you're not perfect. Let them share the, the emotions that you're going through, the struggles. So you can save them from doing maybe the same thing. And I didn't do that. And, and I'm really sorry that I didn't. Well, I was faced in 1984 with the fact that I couldn't continue on and I had to let the business go. And I struggled and agonized with that decision because that meant I would fail. But I had to let it go and uh, I did. It meant the end of my dreams. And you know, all the time I was doing this, I never got a clear answer from the Lord as to what to do. It's just like He had gone away. And I prayed and prayed, but he ne I never heard completely, never clearly. So after the business had fought, failed, I hit the bottom emotionally. And uh, I was emotionally burnt out. And a person who was so highly motivated and so driven to success, I sat in my chair and cried. And I spent a couple weeks, I was just, it was just burnt out. My wife didn't understand what was going on. She thought I ought to be up and be the leader and going out and, and, and going on with life and making money and, and making sure the house was paid for and things. But I, I was hanging on for everything I knew just to survive. I was treading water. I was ready to go under. And so I, I really couldn't. I didn't realize until later that this was a grief process. And you know, we experience losses in our life it may be a business, it may be a relationship, it may be a, a marriage, it can be a child, it could be a death. Anything, there is a loss. There is a grief process. I didn't know anything about this. I needed counseling back then, but I didn't get it. My wife needed counseling, but we didn't get it. Because we didn't recognize the fact that this is a normal process that you go through, that you have to agree with a loss. And there's a times when God has built that into us to do that. In America, we think that, you know, in the past, it's always been you can't show your emotions, you've got to be a macho man. That's not true. That's the way God made us. God made us to deal with grief process. And there's seven steps. But I didn't know anything about them at the time. The other thing is we needed counseling. One of the times in my life when I needed someone to talk to that, that could help me through this was at this point. And I needed a pastor. But I'd been involved in the church for seven years, a small church. I'd been on the board. I'd been on the pulpit committee. We'd called a new pastor. He'd been with us about a year and a half. He was a younger man. We were encouraged the fact that we're going to see a new, younger blood, new growth in the church and things. And so I was uh, worked with him. And he was counseling, as many pastors do. His wife was counseling with him. And then one of the men that they were counseling, she got involved and had an affair with him. She left her husband and divorced him. And this was a husband that I had worked with to get into the church, to be our pastor. And when she did this, it was just like she had stuck a knife in my heart. I was so close to that pastor, it hurt me terrible to think that she would do this to him. He was such a good man. Godly man, beautiful family, some teenage kids. They all sang. I mean, it was just... Uh, tragedy that it happened. And so I was got through that. That was going on with my financial problems were and I was really struggling and I said I gotta have some positive things in my life and so I drew away from the church and pulled out of the church. So at this time I was disconnected really from, from a church and it was a time in my life when I really needed someone to speak talk to. I needed a pastor to guide me and to talk to me but I didn't get it. And I know that my wife could have used the counseling too. Well, fortunately, I didn't stay crying in a chair. Uh, I moved through the process, and uh, I did what was necessary. I had a business profession. I had left the management world. So I picked up my briefcase, I put my shirt and tie on, and I hit the pavement. 
And I started a consulting company and working with businesses and uh, working one day a week or wherever I could work with them. And one of the particular companies I worked with, after I worked with them about six months, they offered me a full-time position as vice president of operations. And I took it and uh, I, I was established in a, in a management field. I was back on a salary. I had benefits again. Uh, I had, it took four years to pay all the debts off that were, uh, that filtered through from the business failure. And so I was, but I was able to do it and I was working through it. And God was opening doors again for me and I was getting back on top. It was very humbling for me to have to go out and to admit that I had been a failure, but I lived through it and I was progressing. I'll say this for the going through the failure. There's one positive thing, and maybe there's more, but one thing for sure is I was delivered of the fear of failure. And there are many people whose lives are driven because of failure, and they're afraid of it. And I found out since that God will allow failure in our lives to free us. Because once we experience it and live through it, it usually sets us free. And I had been programmed from, from youth to, to be success, and God saw that fear, and He said, I want to set you free of it. Well, after my wife and I had weathered the storms, and for two years we're getting through the, the business failure and getting back to normal life, uh, I was starting to beginning to look at things normally again. And uh, now we had three teenager, teenagers in the house all at once. So I had a new battle raging because it was a battleground. And, but fortunately, the, my wife and I stood together and uh, we were winning the battle with the kids and uh, I was beginning to look ahead again. And in 1986, which has been about 20 years after marriage, my wife shocked me. She came to me and she said, our marriage is over, I want a divorce, I want out. And I just could not believe that. And I said, I didn't think I heard her right. Because I said, what did you say? She said, I want a divorce. I said, that's a word that was never to be spoken in my house. Because we were Christians, and God doesn't believe in divorce. And we're, I mean, in other words, we can always work through things. And I've always, always been a problem solver and a person who uh, could solve any problem for anybody. And so I, well, we, can, we just face this problem together. I mean, we weathered some of the worst storms. Now there's hope, there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's where, and she said, no, she said, I'm done. I was faced with the whole cold hard fact of divorce. And uh, the night that she announced that to me was the longest night of my life. And I fell on my face before God and I repented in my prideful spirit because you see, I had been humbled by failing in business but I hadn't been broken. And I, I fell on my face as David did in Psalms 51 when he repented of his sin with Bathsheba. And God led me that night to Psalms 51.10. He said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. And I got I said, that's what I want. I want to start over again. Because I realized that my wife, I had driven her away because of my my attitudes because of my perfectionism and because of the, what I had been in my prideful spirit. And I recognized that I had that responsibility and I, and I com confessed that to God and I said, you know, God forgive me and He did. I asked God, I said, what do you want of me? And He gave me four things He said I want. First of all, I said I want a perfect heart. And a perfect heart is a heart that is loyal to God, or one that's it's mature towards God. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, says, For the eyes of the Lord goes to and fro throughout the earth to show Himself strong on the behalf of those who are loyal to Him or have a perfect heart, a heart that's towards God. He's looking for that. Secondly, He said, I want a broken heart. He says in Psalms 51.17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And number three, he said, I want a humbled heart. 
And that's 1 Peter 5, 6. It humbled yourself, therefore, under the almighty hand of God, that He will exalt you in due time. So God wanted a heart that was towards Him. He wanted a heart that was broken. Not humble, but broken. And then He wanted a heart that stayed humble and continued to be humble because He needs that in us to be able to minister with us. And the fourth thing He said, I want a quiet heart. And he said, you know, in Psalms 46, it says, Be still and know that I am God. And in uh, 1 Kings 19.11, the Lord passed by. You remember this is Elijah in the cave on a mountain. And said, The Lord passed by, and there was a mighty wind that shook the mountain. Then the Lord came as an earthquake, and he broke the mountain. And then he came as fire to consume the mountain. But it said, the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. But a still, small voice that spoke to Elijah. Well, when Elijah heard it, he covered his face. And he left the cave. He said, here, God, I'm here. And that's what the Lord spoke to me in my heart. He said, you know what, I want your heart towards me. I want it to be humble. I want it to be broken. But I want you to continue to listen to me. Hear that. Even if, you know, if we can imagine this, if there's an earthquake, going, earthquake, there's a mighty wind and fire raging around about us, what are we listening to? You listen for that small voice of the Lord that's speaking in your spirit to your heart. So he was preparing me. God was, he, he had my attention. He had put me where he wanted me to be. And he was getting, you know, showing me the things he want, wanted. So in 1990, 10 years after I'd stood at the threshold in 1980, when I prayed the prayer that I said, I want two things from you, God. I want to have a greater understanding of who you are. And I want to experience a faith walk. God was starting to answer my prayers. But all the things that I had counted as value in 1980, the material, the success, and things, who I was, my identity was in what others thought of me, my identity was in what I accomplished, my identity was in what wealth I had, God had stripped all that away from me. And you know, now what I learned in what God wants is that our identity is not in any of those things but in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I had asked my heart to know God better with a deeper understanding. And so He was He was taking me through the steps to show me that. You know, my lifelong dream, my ambition of owning my own company was gone and being my own boss. It failed in bankruptcy. My position in the church was gone because the church had crumbled. My Christian marriage of 23 years was gone, and my wife of 23 years was gone. I was unemployed, again, and I was broke. After the divorce, all the assets that I had were gone. Cleaned up, I took the rest of them to pay the business debt off. And when I walked out of that, I had no money, nothing. No job, no money, and everything. But I had a clean slate to start over again, and I had God. And I knew that I could start again, and I knew this time that I was hearing God, and I knew that He had a, that I would follow Him. I was living in a rented apartment at the time. My two unmarried daughters were pregnant, and my 17-year-old son had just dropped out of school and walked away from me. So I sat with all the pieces of my life crumbled, fallen down around me. But now they were on the ground because up to this time in the last five years, I wasn't able to do anything because of the decisions other people were making for me. And I came to the Lord and I said, God, I'm not, I want to know you and I want to know who you are and I will not move until you tell me or talk to me or show me or explain to me who you are. So I reaffirmed my prayers in 1980 
Day after day, I was determined to know God, who He was, personally. And I said to the Lord, I said, God, I'm going to denounce all the knowledge I have basically been taught who you are. I'm going to denounce what the denominations have taught me who you are. I'm going to denounce who I think you are. Now you speak to me in your spirit. And I'm not moving from here until I hear. And I did this day after day. And it wasn't in a day that he did this. It was several weeks. And I continued to press into the Lord and say, God, show me who you are. One day, the Lord gave me a revelation, and He showed me who He was. And when the full understanding of who God was impacted me, you know, I understood that my Creator, God of the universe, who created me, had so much love for me that He determined because of our broken covenant through Adam that we were fallen and we could not have that relationship with Him, that He loved me so much that He became Jesus and came to earth in flesh and dwelt amongst men. And that we, His creation, refused Him, we spit on Him, we hated Him, we totally rejected His plan, and we even crucified Him. But praise God, He didn't stay in the grave. But this was God's plan. For my redemption. When redemption means He bought me back. He created me and made me, but because of sin, I was separated. And so the salvation is our relationship back with the Lord, that we can have fellowship with God and walk with our Heavenly Father. When a full impact this hit me, it crushed me. I just broke. Because I realized who God was. And I said, God. I'm a nobody. I mean, what would I have to offer anybody, especially my Creator, when I understood who He was? And this was the thing that, that, that really gripped my heart. But sometime after this, it wasn't very long, the Lord gave me a vision. Well, I had never had a vision. I didn't recognize it as a vision at the time, but since then I've come to understand what visions are. But in the vision, it was just like the, the Spirit took me out and carried me out and set me, stood me on a beach in Lake Michigan on the sand. And, in that, and then a voice spoke to me, my heart, and he said, Can you see the grain of sand that is buried three feet under your feet? And I said, God, I can't even see the grain of sand at my feet. And then he said, I can. And he said, you are that grain of sand. That blew me away. Here's my creator, God of the universe, speaking to me and saying, you're like that grain of sand and I see you. Then he spoke to me again and he said, I created you for a purpose. And I see you and you are somebody. And I have a job for you to do here on earth for my kingdom of heaven. And so my prayer that I had asked, God, who are you? He had just spoken to me. Not by someone else, but direct through my spirit to say, you know, I am God of the universe and I love you. So after months of seeking God's face, He was revealing Himself to me and was showing me who He was and who I was. And I was able to trust Him for everything and live by faith as I had asked Him for. In the process of starting over again in 1990 and earnestly seeking God's face, He was revealing Himself to me through His Holy Spirit. I was always aware of the Holy Spirit, but I had not experienced the manifestation of the Spirit. And I was searching to gain a deeper understanding of who God was and what the Bible meant when it said in Ephesians 1.19, What is the excellent greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So I began a study on the Holy Spirit. And I was going to the singles group that uh, my future wife Judy was teaching. We were friends at the time. And the weeks that followed, each of us was searching for the Holy Spirit to learn more about the Holy Spirit. And God was in the Spirit was leading us to places where we were experiencing Him and we are seeing the manifestations of His workings. As Judy and I came to appreciate each other and, and we spent hours sharing what the Holy Spirit was revealing to each of us, we began to understand that we complemented each other, that we had uh, something that worked together and that we found out that our spiritual gifts were actually flowed together. So when we prayed for people, we worked together. And uh, this was something neither of us had, had seen or experienced prior to this. And then the Lord spoke to me, and He said, you will marry Judy. <coughs> and as far as Judy's concerned, that was the last thing she would ever look for. Or hear. She, had, she said, I don't believe God ever wants me to get married again. And so, but the Lord spoke to me, in time, she began to realize that we were flowing together and working together, and how God was using us, and that we could be a ministry team, and that was a heart, our heart's desire was to be used of God. I'm not going to go into the details of our relationship that we had, but uh, I want to tell you that we have a real story to tell because God had to change her heart, and that was a miracle. <laughs> that was a miracle because. That itself, because she did not believe God would ever let her get married again. And so, maybe someday she'll write a book about it. But uh, right now we're going to go into it. Well, in April 1991, Judy and I got married. And uh, much to my surprise, because God moved so quickly to put, fill this big hole in me that I had. And uh, it was truly a miracle. We're each on our own journey seeking God and trying to understand the Holy Spirit and what His purpose in, in, in our walk or walking with the Lord meant. And we came to understand that what we were really seeking was the immersion in the Spirit. That we had head knowledge, we knew God, we walked with God, we heard God's voice speaking to us, but we weren't immersed in the Holy Spirit or we weren't anointed or sunk or immersed in anointing, really. And so we were seeking that. Judy was seeking it more than I was. So in the late summer of 1991, we were invited to go to a healing seminar in Grand Rapids. And uh, Judy was all excited because she was really seeking the gifts. And I was saying, cautiously going, as an observer, and I am saying, because of my prior training in, in uh, teaching, I was saying, I'm going to make sure this is God. and we're, I'm not getting involved in it. Because I'm not going to be led astray or led off course. What we experienced that weekend changed our lives. And uh, what we heard from God was answers to some of the questions that we had as far as, as, far as who God was it, the Holy Spirit was. So at this first se session, which ended on Friday night. The speaker's name was a Pastor Nicholson, Steve Nicholson. And he'd gotten up, shared his testimony with us, and nothing spectacular, hadn't done anything unusual other than just talk. Tell us all about his life and his church and that type of thing. He said, but before we close, we never close our meetings without inviting the Holy Spirit to come. And he said, minister to us. So he said, Holy Spirit, come. He said, I have to stand up. And he just said, Holy Spirit, come. And we stood and waited. And uh, nothing happened. And he said, just be patient. He'll come. And uh, we waited some more. And uh, after about five minutes, we waited. And this seemed like an eternity when, eternity when you're standing there and quiet. He said, he'll come. And then all of a sudden, I heard we heard some people groaning. And it got louder 
and louder. And of course, what's going on? It was behind us. And he said, don't be worried. He said, God is touching the people that have compassionate hearts. He's softening their heart. He's touching them. He's just, he's working. Well, then we heard a big crash. Somebody fell under the power of the Holy Spirit behind us and crashed down on that And again, I said I was, I was just listening and over observing. I had never experienced anything like this. But I knew in my heart that it was real. I knew it was God. As more and more people were impacted by the Holy Spirit, Pastor Nichols encouraged others to pray and seek the Holy Spirit. But well, we ended the evening with a new appreciation of the power that God had worked, what that God that works in us in Ephesians 1.19. During the ministry time that weekend, Judy got baptized in the Holy Spirit, Spirit, Spirit and she experienced uh, some strange phenomena in her body and things, and uh, she was changed. But I hadn't experienced anything spectacular. I other than the fact, as I said, when he said, come Holy Spirit, I felt like someone had taken a feather and brushed my eyebrow. Later I learned that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is sometimes a smear or a brush on the brow. And that happened to me that night. But the manifestation of the Spirit that came upon me was months later. And, uh, and as I started laying hands on Judy and praying for her, then the Spirit started manifesting. Speaking in tongues came in time. Because I had had such an uh, unbelief and staunch stand against the gifts, the manifestation of the gifts came gradual. And they came as the Spirit showed me my error, and I denounced or repented of my dead works, which I had walked to the Lord for so many years. Then the, the fullness of the gifts came. See, the very thing I had desired most in my life, the working of God and the power of God through me, had been rejected by me because of my ignorance and training. The parable of the sower came to mind, and Jesus taught his disciples. And he said, Some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air swooped down and snatched it up. And then he explained to them that parable when he said, he said, that's like the seed that uh, falls uh, in someone's ears or you hear the word of the kingdom, the truth of the kingdom. But before you can grasp it and bring it into your life, your enemy, Satan, comes and snatches it away from you. So he said, you're like the parable. The truth of the kingdom of heaven which God intended to allow us to fellowship with Him and to empower us to minister with Him had been concealed to me by Satan. But praise God, God showed it to me. God says, He said, If ye seek me, ye shall find me diligently and with your whole heart. In closing, I want to say that God is a loving Father. He cares about his kids. And through trials, trials, and testings, he wants to develop our character and make us into his image. He also wants to stretch us to prepare us to walk in what he the purpose he has created for our life. He did not promise us a rose garden or an easy walk. But he did promise us that he said, I will deliver you out of all your afflictions. Amen. And he said, and I will give you in grace to endure them. He made a covenant with us to prosper us and to give us good health and to bless our lives if we obey his commandments. Also, I'd like to say that God does restore when we have losses in our life and we seek Him and we don't turn from Him and we continue to press into Him and we're obedient 
He restores. He said, I will restore unto you what the locusts have eaten. In 1993, two years after Judy and I had been married, the Lord, the Lord restored financially about all I had lost in my business ventures. Just that, like that. And so I can say, it's a testimony before you, that although I had walked with the Lord many years, served Him faithfully, but because I had a desire in my heart to know God deeper and a better walk, God heard that prayer and He said, I want to make it. Son, He said, you've got spots in your heart that need to be cleaned up. He said, you've got some things in your life that you need to be set free of. And you know, He did it in a way I would have never wanted it done. But He's God. He's my Creator. And you know, we give our life to Him. We're Christians and we turn it over to Him. He's good. And we say, God, here I am, hands off. Do with me what you want. But I'm going to serve you faithfully even if I die. Well, then we've given Him permission to do what He wants. We've given Him permission to do what it takes, really, because it's, we have made the decision. And it's because of our decisions and our choices why we've had to walk the way we have most of the time. Some of the time we may want to use this for ministry, and so it allows us to, to, to experience things that will help uh, others through our lives. So the Lord did answer my prayer from 1980. And it took about 14 years to do it. But praise God He did. And through all, through all the trials and testing, I still stay true. And I would just encourage anybody that's here tonight in, in the audience, that if you need prayer for deliverance, if you need to be set free, if you need wholeness, if you need delivered from fear or failure or whatever, that we'll spend some time in ministry for you. Tonight I have shared my story, which has become his story of my life. I know all of us have a story, but my purpose for telling you my story and the purpose of Full Gospel Men's Fellowship is to give you an opportunity to hear a testimony of the power and love of God in people's lives and to invite anyone who is hearing or seeing this program an opportunity to experience Jesus in their lives. And right now, I would just like to take a few minutes because I've shared that I was born again as a child, that I walked with the Lord, that I walked faithfully, and I gave God permission to deal in my life, to, to make a difference in me, to create in me what He had purposed me for. But some of you may have never experienced salvation. You've never gone to the first step. And tonight I'm going to extend that invitation. The first thing you have to do is you can come. And so you now can realize that you can have a relationship with your Creator, with your Heavenly Father, because God loves you as He loved me. And He prepared a plan to redeem you or buy you back like He did me. And it is through His Son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. And that's true because that's the way God set it up. And He was the Creator. So Hi. I am here because you and I have a divine appointment. And, you know, we all have a certain place and a certain time that God's got already pre-planned. And just to give you an idea, a long time ago, before I was even born, God had a plan for me. He, he had a plan so that I would be here with you today. And it's not by mistake that you're listening to this. It's not by mistake that you are hearing the words that I'm going to be saying because he knew. In Jeremiah, 
1, 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And so I am here as a prophet to, to tell you some of the things that God has done for me. Now, I also want to go to um, Jeremiah 18 because it was a real significant time in my life. And I think it is for all of us. I had, was going to a Sunday school class, and the teacher that we had at the time brought in a piece of clay. And this little piece of clay is very significant in my life. This was in 1989. He brought these pieces of clay in. And he said, you can do whatever you want with these pieces of clay. And I left mine the way it was. And then he did a teaching on Jeremiah 18. And I want to read what Jeremiah 18 said, just a part of it. It says, um, go down to the potter's house, and there there will be something on the wheel. But the vessel that uh, the potter was making was spoiled. The clay was spoiled. And he said, um, so what he did was he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter. These are in my own words, by the way. This is not quoting directly from Scripture. Then he says, Cannot I, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And that Scripture gripped me so strong that I went back the next day and I put my name in there. And I want you to put your name in there as I read this because it was, uh, it just made it so personal. And I read, Cannot I, O Judy, deal with you as this potter does? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. And you know, that was a turning point in my life because I realized that God was going to do whatever he wanted to do, you know? And I think that we all reach a point where, where we are not what we want to be. And we think, how can God possibly use me? Or this is not uh, the right way that I'm going to be going. This is not how it should be. And so we just need to give ourselves to God and we need to let him do what he wants to do. And sometimes he remakes us. Sometimes he totally changes the course that we think we ought to be going. Now in my case, um, he did change my course of life. But you know what he said in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.4? He said, God, who comforts us in all of our affliction, um, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with a comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So in other words, God um, is the one that comforts us in our affliction so that we can comfort others. And so that's why I'm here today, because I, I know that people go through some of the same things that I went through. Maybe not exactly the same way, and maybe not exactly the same circumstances, but we all have the similar feelings. We all feel the same, the same ways. And I just want to tell you uh, some of the struggles that I had. But first of all, um, my life started kind of in a bad way. My mother had multiple sclerosis. And so I grew up basically without a mother because she was so busy taking care of herself and uh, my dad was busy taking care of her. And they tried desperately to find out what they could do about multiple sclerosis. And so our whole life was based around that. And there was nothing that that was important in my life as far as my parents were concerned because they were so enthralled with what they were doing. And so consequently, my whole life was spent wanting a normal life. Now, I don't know how you've been, but um, I, I had this picture in my mind of what a normal life was. And I kept thinking that if I just had a nice house, if I just had a good marriage and good family life, and if I could just buy my clothes from a regular store 
instead of buying them from the Salvation Army or having people give them to me secondhand. I mean, that, those are the things that were important to me at the time. And as I grew up, that always stayed with me. Those are the things that I wanted. Well, I was a young adult, and I went to the dentist because I had a lot of work that needed to be done. And when I went to the dentist, I was scared to death because when I was growing up, of course, I'd never gone to the dentist. And that was just a, not a normal thing to do. So when I got in there, I had 14 cavities that needed to be taken care of and two teeth needed to be pulled. And um, he pulled out this needle that looked like it was about two feet long. Mm -hmm. And I about croaked. <laughs> and I said, there's no way you're putting that in my mouth. And he says, oh, it won't hurt. And I said, no way, Jose, you're not putting that in my mouth. And so I was so upset and I was so, I was just traumatized by what had happened. And so he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a prescription and you come back in two weeks. And so two weeks later, I took two pills before I left and I stumbled into his office. And I'll tell you what, he was my best friend. <laughs> I wasn't afraid of him anymore until he pulled that needle out. And when he did, I said, mm-mm. And he said, well, don't worry. He said, I'll give you some laughing gas and you won't feel a thing. So he gave me the gas and he said, you know, uh, you'll still be awake and you won't, you won't feel a thing, but you'll know what's going on around you. He said, it won't put you under. So you don't have to worry about it. So I said, okay. So um, I laid back in the chair and he started working on me and I closed my eyes because I didn't want to watch him while he was doing his work. While I laid there with my eyes closed, I could see out in this total black, I could see a round globe. And on that globe, I was on it. And I was on my belly and I was crawling around, going around this globe. Well. As I was crawling around this globe on my belly, I heard this voice, uh, this was total blackness all the way around this globe. And I heard this voice, and the voice said to me, this is all there is, there isn't any more. This is all there is, there isn't any more. All the way around that globe, I kept hearing that voice. This is all there is, there isn't any more. And I'm thinking, oh, th this is awful if I just have to keep going around and round and round forever. I mean, life is bad enough, let alone it just going on and on and on, you know? So as I come around the top part of the globe, I saw this peak, and it was like an upside down V. And I was going up to the top of the globe, and as I got to the top of the globe, I went over this peak, and when I did, it was the most excruciating, awful struggle I'd ever had in my life. It was just intense. It was awful. And it wasn't painful, but it was just horrible. And I kept thinking, oh, you know, I, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. But I finally got past it. I got on the other side. And there's that voice again. This is all there is. There isn't any more. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, it was just like round and round this globe I went. And I kept hearing this voice. And I kept going over this peak that was just horrible. And I just, I, I, I woke up screaming. And I had my arms around the Oh, this Dennis Tips, I mean, he must have been 90 years old, and he's like, like this, you know, thinking, what in the world is going on? But I was screaming, and I was crying, and I just felt like everything vulgar came out of me when I was screaming. I asked him if I had sworn, and he said no, but I didn't believe him. I just kept thinking that I said terrible things when I was coming out of that dream. And he finally, just in dismay, told me to go home. He didn't know what to do with me. He'd never had anything like that happen. So anyways, I went home, and all the way home, I kept hearing this voice. And it kept saying, this is all there is. There isn't any more. And I kept thinking, there's got to be more to this than that, than 
to life than what I was living, what I was hearing, and what I was enduring. And you know, I could remember when my grandfather um, told me, he was a lay preacher, and I was a little girl, and he used to tell me, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And if you want to get to heaven, you've got to be good. And if you want to go to hell, you're going to be bad. And I was like, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And after that little scenario and that voice kept pounding at me that this was all there is, I kept thinking, there has got to be more. There has got to be more. But I didn't know what it was. Nobody ever told me how to get to heaven. They just said, you've got to get there. So I went to God because my grandparents, when I was little, that's what they did. They prayed all the time. And so I thought I would try that. I hadn't done that before on my own. So I got on my knees one night and I said, God, I want to go to heaven and be with you someday. And I'm really sorry that I've been a bad person. Nothing happened. And I expected something to happen, but it didn't. And the next night, I got back down on my knees again and I said, God, I don't want to go to hell. Would you help me to get to heaven? I don't want to go to hell. I know I've been bad. Please forgive me for my sins. Nothing happened. And I'm like, what is going on? So the next night, I get on my knees again and I said, God, please forgive me. I know I haven't been the kind of person that you want in heaven, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I don't want to go to hell. Nothing happened. Well, the next night, I finally was desperate. I was really angry. Did you ever get mad at God? Well, I was. I didn't know if there, where he was or anything, but I, I was mad at him. And I, you know, just like this, and I said, Okay, God, if you are there, you're going to have to prove yourself to me because if you don't, I'm not going to know what to do. And how can I believe in God if I don't see you or hear you? So you're just going to have to prove it to me that you're there. And, you know, I went to bed that night, and I was feeling pretty hopeless. And I was feeling really discouraged, and I kept thinking... <laughs> That probably isn't a God after all. This life is probably just whatever it is right now. I might as well just forget whatever I thought. I went to bed, went to sleep. The next day was Saturday. And I got up and it, Saturdays were kind of a nothing day and I was watching TV. And I was watching a program where um, it was out in um, India, I think it was where they blow the, their horns and the snakes come out of the baskets, you know, and they were just talking about it and what they do and everything, and I had seen it before, so it wasn't anything new. And all of a sudden, the program was preempted. And you know how you can stop and listen when nothing comes across your TV because you're waiting for something to happen? And so I'm like, oh, I wonder what's coming. And all of a sudden, I heard this loud voice, and it said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I'll tell you what, I was sitting in, in, in a couch like this, right in the end, and I started shaking all over. I got red, as just red. My heart was pounding. I could feel it. And I started crying, and I just, I knew that was God, and it was like, whoa, that was God, you know? And I kept thinking that verse. I knew that verse. I think I heard my grandpa say that verse. And so it must have been in the Bible. Well, my Bible was buried in my closet in a box way in the bottom. And so I ran to the closet, and I dug everything out, and I found my Bible. And I realized that it was in there because after a while I found it. It's in Matthew. And it says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I thought, oh, there's a God. He's really here. Wow, this is so neat. And he really is a God. And I was so excited. You know, for two weeks I just, I was on cloud nine because I was so happy to know that this life was not all there was. That there was a God. And there was more. 
But after a couple of weeks, it was like, oh, I'm going to have to do something about this. What am I going to do? You know, I didn't know what to do, but I knew in my heart that I had to respond to the fact there was a God. So I went searching, and I went to the bookstore, and I read books on heaven. I read books on hell. I read books about God. I read books about Satan. I bought a Ouija board. I did the Ouija board. I read tea leaves. I did horoscopes. You name it. I tried it because I wanted to know some answers. And you know, when you don't know something and you really want some answers, you're going to find them one way or the other. And today, there are so many evil avenues that we can take. You know, there's a psychic line you can call. You can get answers if you want them. You can uh, read horoscopes. You can find the answers. They're going to tell you. And you know, the devil, he lies, steals, and destroys. And he's going to tell you things if you're looking. So make sure that you're looking in the right place. Make sure you go to the right place. And I'm going to tell you how to find the right place. Because in my searching, I didn't find any answers. Nothing that really made me happy. And I kept thinking, no, this isn't right. Uh, the things that I got on the Ouija board, it was like, yeah, you know, it didn't, it didn't really set good. But, you know, I had a background in the church, and I kind of knew what was good and what was bad, except nobody ever told me what to do about it. Well, I decided I missed getting dressed up to go to church, and so I went to church again. I thought, if I could just get dressed up, maybe I'll feel better about myself. Maybe I'll even find some answers if I go to church. And so I had two little kids, and I thought Sunday school would be really good for them. And so we went to church. We got there, and unfortunately, I didn't hear about anything that I didn't know. I heard the same old thing. Well, after a while, my aunt, she called me. She said, you know what? She says, um, I, I would like you to come to our church and visit. It's bigger. So I thought, well, why not? So I went to a church. And after I'd been going there for a little while, a lady called me and she said, you know what? She says, uh, one of the girls in our class just got saved. And we would like to invite you to our Bible study. Would you be interested in coming? Well, I didn't know what saved was all about. But I did want to go to the Bible study because I thought maybe they would have some answers. So I went. After I decided to go, we, we, we met the first time. And um, I didn't know exactly what I was going to hear, but I was anxious for anything. I was just looking for some answers. We sat down the first time, and she looked at me, and she said, Well, Judy, she said, are you saved? And I'm like, ah, uh, ah, uh, well, um... You know, what do you say? I didn't even know what it meant. And she said, well, here, let me show you. And so she pulled her Bible around, and um, she said, she read some scripture to me. And one of the scriptures was Romans 3.23, and it said um, that, we, that we missed the mark, that, that none of us are as good as we should be. And... I thought, yeah, that's me. I'm not as good as I could be. I know I'm a sinner. I know that. And then she read a verse from Romans 12, 12, 10, I think it is, that said that if we confess God and um, believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, that we believe Jesus and that he was raised from the dead, that if we, if we really and truly believe that God raised him from the dead, that we could be saved. And it was like, wow, yes, is that all I need to do? Is that all I need to say to be saved, to know 
that I'm going to go to heaven and be with God someday. So I decided to do that. And I said, yes, God, you can have me. Yes, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I want you in my life. When I said that, it felt like 5,000 pounds just lifted right off my shoulders. Literally, it was gone. And it felt so good. It just felt so good. I knew that something happened. You know, you can have that too. You can have all of everything that I was looking for. You don't have to go through all the struggles that I was going for, that I was going through. But there's only one way that you can get there. That one way is Jesus. You know, I prayed and I asked God to help me get to heaven. Nothing happened. Because there's only one way that he provided for you to get to heaven. And that one way is Jesus. I'm going to tell you about a story that I want you to picture yourself in. I want you to think about what you would do. Now, um, let's just picture you seeing this invitation to the open house. This is an open invitation to the White House. And the President of the United States has sent this out. And the only stipulation is that you need to respond to it. And so you think, wow, I want to go. And so you spend a year getting ready. I mean, you save your money. You buy the nicest clothes. You read all kinds of books about the president. You find out what he likes, what he doesn't like. You read all the books you can on etiquette so that when you go and, and you're sitting here eating at this banquet with the finest china, and the, these wonderful linen napkins that you know exactly how to act and what to do and say. And so you're going to get ready for all of this. And um, one of these days, you finally get ready. You finally say, oh, I've, I've got everything ready and the date is coming up. And so you get ready and you get your car and you go to the White House and and let's just say um, you're going to go up to the White House, pull up to the White House, and you're going to knock on the door. Go, knock on it. And the doorman comes to the door. And he looks at you and you say, Hi, my name is Judy Peel, and I'm here for the banquet. And he says, Well, come in, have a seat. I'll be back with you in just a moment. And so um, he comes back and he says, Well, I'm sorry, but your name is not on the guest list. And you say, oh, that's okay, that's okay. I, you know, I, I got really busy because I was doing so much work for him. I mean, I was busy reading all about him. I even went down and I worked in the polls and I helped people um, to vote for him. I even told people to vote for him. That's how good he, I, I knew he was. And I did everything I could to help him. I'm sure that he's going to let me in. And the man is going to say, I'm sorry, but your name is not on the guest list. He doesn't know you personally. And you're just going to go away. Feeling so dejected. But you know what? There's a similar story to that Bible. You know what? In um, Matthew 7.23, what it says, Jesus is going to have a banquet someday. And he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Just picture this. There's an open invitation for you to come to heaven and be at the banquet with Jesus. And you're so busy getting ready. I mean, you're doing everything that you possibly can to get ready to go to this banquet. And someday, you're going to be there, and you're going to be knocking on the door of heaven, and you're going to say, Hi, my name is Judy Peel. And he's, Jesus is going to say, um, Angels, and he's going to call the angels over, and they're going to bring him the book of life. And he's going to look down the book of life to see if your name is there. Because he's not going to let you in the banquet unless your name is in the book of life. And he goes down there and he says, I'm sorry, your name is not in the book of life. 
and you say, oh, that's okay, but you don't know everything I did for you. I mean, I went to church every Sunday. I read your Bible all the time. I told people about you. I did everything you told me to do. I mean, I was a good person. I was love. I did everything I was supposed to do. I did everything you told me to do. And now I'm here for your banquet. And he'll say, I'm sorry, but I don't know you personally. I want to give you that opportunity to know him personally. Because there's only one way that you can get to heaven. You see, all those times I prayed to God, and I asked God to please let me into heaven. I was sorry for my sin. But nothing happened. You know why? Because I didn't know Jesus personally. But when I did, when I said, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. God says, that's good enough for me. That's all I want. I want her to know Jesus because he's the way to get to heaven. And that's what he's saying to you. He wants you to know Jesus so that when you go to heaven, he's going to say, yeah, her name is in the book of life. His name is in the book of life. They're okay. They're going to be here for the banquet. They've been personally invited. Now I want to tell you that the way you ask Jesus into your heart is by praying. Thank you. By praying and asking God to help you have Jesus in your life, to ask him to forgive you for your sins. You know, we're all sinners because it says in Romans 3.23 that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when I heard that, I said, yes, that's me. <laughs> I know I'm not the way I'm supposed to be. And probably we all feel like that at some point in our life. We all know. And you know, there's protocol to getting to heaven. And that protocol is knowing Jesus. And so I'm going to pray a prayer and I want you to pray that prayer with me. If you don't know him personally, I want you to pray this prayer and invite him into your life and into your heart. I want you to say, yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. And I want you to just close your eyes right now. And it's just a matter of, in your heart, just pray along with me. God, I know that I have been a sinner. I know I have not been the kind of person that you want me to be. And Lord, I know that you sent Jesus Christ to be my Savior, to save me from my sin, to help me to get to heaven. He's the only way. I really believe that. And Lord, I know that I want Jesus in my life, that you that he died on the cross and that you raised him from the dead, that he's living today and that he can live in my heart, that I can live and, and just live for you, God, and that I can be in heaven with you someday, that this life is not all there is. Just forgive me for my sins. And yes, I invite Jesus in my life. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. And I just want to encourage you to know that Jesus is praying for you. Because if you want him in your life, he is concerned about you. And he knows the kind of life that you're living now. He knows the kind of life that, that you're faced with. He knows everything that you are going through. And at the end of this program, I have something that I want to give you that will help you so that you can be reminded constantly of what Jesus is saying for you to God. The second part of my life began after I asked Jesus in my heart. See, first I knew that there was God, then I knew that there was Jesus, and then there was another portion of my life that I want to tell you about, because that portion is very important also. 
You know, sometimes we do things that we don't understand and we don't always go the way God wants us to go. Sometimes we are drawn apart from God and we don't always know what we're doing because we're not real familiar with some of the ways of God. And after I asked Jesus into my life, um, I met up with a man that I just really thought was wonderful. He was a Christian, and we went to church together, and everything seemed rosy. And you know, all the time that I grew up wanting a normal life, I never had it. And now I felt like I could have it because I was going to have a normal marriage. I was going to go to church and have a normal life. I just, I just knew it. And when he asked me to marry him, I thought, I don't want to do anything unless God tells me I can do it. And so I went to the Lord and I asked him if he would please answer me. You know, what do you want me to do? Well, he didn't answer me. And I didn't, I didn't get any clear direction. And so I kept thinking, well, maybe if he just tells the pastor that it's okay for us to get married, that would be good enough. And so I said, Lord, you know, if you want me to um, marry this man, make it possible that the, that the pastor would say it's okay. Well, you know, the, the pastor did say okay. The church elders said it was okay. And so I was all excited, thinking, wow, this is really neat, you know. I can get married. And Well, we got married, and my normal life was happening. And, you know, i got to read Proverbs 15, 16. Because that's a verse that we all need to remember. It says... Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. And that's what was happening in my life. You see, the normal life that I wanted so desperately was happening. I was getting everything I wanted. I had a new home. I had a new car. I had um, clothes. I had everything that I ever dreamt. But I wasn't happy. I had a lot of turmoil in my life. I didn't know why, but I just wasn't happy. You know, I sacrificed God to have a good marriage. And sometimes we have to really consider if we are sacrificing the very thing that, that we wanted the most for the unsettling for things that we just wanted. Because we do that without realizing it. Satan is very deceptive, and he will lie to us. He will make us think that, oh, this is a good thing, or that's a good thing, or, oh, man, this is something I really, I could, I could use this for God. But in reality, it's not what the Lord wanted at all. And so we need to consider that what we do is really, if it's for God or not, I was feeling so desperate that I had a Bible study all by myself. And um, I, th I kept thinking, I've got to find a way to get closer to God again. i got to find a way to get that back, what I lost. Because he wasn't doing miracles in my life anymore. He wasn't answering all my prayers anymore. And I didn't feel him in my life the way I felt him. He, he was gone. He was distant. I knew that I was saved. I knew that I was going to go to heaven. But I didn't have that same feeling of closeness with him. So I got a Bible study. And I would sit down in the morning after the kids went to school and my husband would go to work. And I would just study the Bible. But you know what? It was impossible to do. Because we had a mini farm and we had all kinds of animals. Well, every time I sat down to study the Word of God, those animals made more noise than you could imagine. I mean, the outdoor animals and the indoor animals. I had a cat that continuously jumped on my lap every time I got my Bible out. 
we had a dog that just a big dog and he was always right there wagging his tail wanting his attention and barking and just making all kinds of racket and we had a bird that just relentlessly made terrible noises when I was trying to study the Bible I couldn't do it and besides the chickens and the and the ducks and what have you outdoors it was impossible to concentrate so I closed my Bible and I said God I can't study your word with all of this noise. And you're going to have to shut these animals' mouths up in order for me to do this. And I really want to hear from you. And you know what? Everything, everything got quiet. And I was so excited because I knew that God did it. He was still doing miracles. And I was so excited because he hadn't done a miracle for me for a long time. In fact, right after I got married, my husband had said to me, you know, you, you shouldn't be praying about everything. That's kind of like fantasy world. And you need to be doing things. You need to be practicing um, doing the things after you pray about it. You need to... You need to do it. Put your feet to your prayers. You know what they say? And so um, after a while, I was just thinking, well, maybe I should just pray about it and let God do it. Um, maybe I would get up and just do it myself. And so that's what I had done. And in the process of doing that, I lost a lot of the spiritual contact with God that I had had. And he stopped doing miracles in my life because I didn't expect him to do them anymore. And, you know, we have to be very careful because he wants us to rely on him totally. Yes, we have to act. We have to act in faith. We have to do in faith. We have to do the things that God tells us to do. But we have to rely totally on him because he is our source. He's the only source. He's the one that gives us everything. Well, after I realized that God was still doing miracles in my life, I was really excited. And I just got all of that enthusiasm back. And my Bible study became real again. My Bible study spoke to me, and I could hear God again. Then we decided to move. When we moved, we moved out of the city. We built another house. You know what? All of that went away because I got so busy doing the things, getting ready for building this house. And, and actually, I mean, we did everything in the house. And the kids were teenagers. And just going through life in general was hectic. And I did not have time for God. I mean, that, you know, we just, I just didn't. And I think a lot of times, Life gets us so busy that we don't have time for God. But he says we need to take time for him. So after we moved, and I didn't have time for him, I lost everything again. And in the process of losing that, I went deeper in the hole. And I went into what I call the three-year void. And in that void... I call it the void because I didn't hear anything. I heard nothing. I was destitute. And I just felt like, where is God? Where is God? Where? What happened to everything I had? I was feeling like I was far, far away. I was reading in Lamentations. And I was still reading my Bible. But I was reading in Lamentations, and I want to read what it said. Um, let's see where it went here. Lamentations 3. This is exactly how I felt. And I read this. It said, He has driven me and made me walk. He besieged and encompassed me with bitterness and hardship. And boy, that's just where I felt I was. He made my chain heavy, and I was dragging. He shut out my prayers. Did you ever feel like your prayers went to the ceiling and that was it? That's how I felt. I mean, there was a, there was a, 
a ceiling there that my prayers were not getting past. And that was as far as they went. He made my paths crooked. He did. He made my paths real crooked. Everything I did was hard. He torn me to pieces. He filled me with bitterness, and I was very bitter. I was bitter towards everything and everybody. You know, I think when you're feeling bitterness inside, everything around you becomes bitter. I mean, you don't see anything good. Everything you see is bad. My soul has been rejected from peace, and I have forgotten happiness. And I did. I did not know what happiness was like anymore. My strength has perished, and so my hope from the Lord is gone. And it was. I had no hope anymore. Um, I just felt like there was no reason to live. At this time, I just felt like there was useless to even try to be like I was previous. Like there was no hope for me. Well, I was so desperate that three years, this was three years later. That's why I say three-year void. I mean, I'd gone through three years of feeling like this. I'd gone back to Lamentations again. And this time, I read a few verses beyond that. This is what it said. Surely, my soul remembers, therefore I will have hope. And I thought, maybe there is hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. And I thought about that, and I thought, is it true that his loving kindness never ceases? Maybe, just maybe. For his compassions never fail. I thought, could that be that his compassion never fails? If that's true, there's hope for me says, God is thy faithfulness. Great is, is his faithfulness. I have hope in him. And I thought, can I have hope in him? The Lord is good to those who wait for him. What a blessing it has been to hear these precious folks sharing what God has done in their lives. You know, this Jesus... He's probably the most controversial person in all of creation. At least down here on this planet. People use his name as a swear word. I've done that. Didn't have a clue that I was offending God by using his name as a swear word. Well, Perhaps you've been flipping channels and you're not sure what you're watching. This is the Precious Testimonies broadcast. You can learn more about us by going to our uh, ministry website. That should pop up there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you can't see that, it's just www.preciousTestimonies.com and you'll go to our website. If you punch that up on the internet and you'll be able to Read uh, many, many other Jesus-glorifying testimonies, such as what you've heard on this broadcast. Also, there are other video testimonies you can watch, and there are Christian writings on the website. So there's uh, various spiritual resources for people uh, to uh, help in their relationship with God if they go to the website. We encourage people to pray about getting in contact with us. Uh, if they want to have their written testimony published on that website and or if they would like to uh, have their video testimony connected uh, to these broadcasts in any particular way, why we want to see what God uh, would want to do okay, regarding that uh, issue. My friend, as we uh, move to the end of this broadcast, I just want to address those of you who may be watching this and you are wondering more than maybe ever before about this one called Jesus. What do I do about this Jesus? 
what am I expected to do by God regarding Jesus? Or is this Jesus what is the thing or person that I'm missing in my life? In fact, my friend, you might be in a place right now where you're so discouraged with life that you would you're close to probably wishing it would end or maybe you wished it would end a long time ago or maybe you're so frustrated you don't know which way to turn well I want to encourage you my friend consider what I'm about to share with you none of us know when our heart is going to stop. God can give us that desire real quick to be done with this life. And the New Testament Bible says there's two places that we're going to go ultimately once we die. One group of people will spend eternity with the Creator, God Himself, and they will experience joy forevermore. The other group the Bible says, is a broader group. Many more people will go this way. They will be separated from their Creator, their God, for eternity once judgment has been pronounced in their lives. And they will spend eternity away from God. They will be in hell. A place where they're not only separated from God, but they will know for eternity they could have had the other eternity. That other eternity where a few chose the only way that God has provided for humanity to be right with Him. That other way is through none other than Jesus Christ.